stop giving people the diagnosis of depression. Depression is a symptom cluster. It shouldn't be a diagnosis. I want to get into all those strategies, uh, but let's talk a little bit about what's driving this. And the G in bright minds is genetics, but we don't think about it properly. But that he just was just reflecting what society believes that you're weak if you have a mental health problems. You're Oh, well, I'm overweight because my family's overweight, or I have hypertension because it runs in my family, or I have diabetes because it runs in my family, or I have Alzheimer's disease, or I'm vulnerable to it, and there's nothing I can do about it. And that's a lie. Genes increase your vulnerability, and they teach you what you should be doing. So, for example, I have six children, three of them are adopted, two of my nieces we adopted because their parents couldn't stop with drugs and alcohol and it was a disaster for these kids. And I tell my nieces, if you never drink or do drugs, you're never going to have a problem. But if you do, it could be serious. You need to be on an alcohol drug prevention program every day mm. of your life. I have obesity and heart disease in my family. I'm gonna be 70 this year. I'm not overweight and I don't have heart disease because I'm on an obesity heart disease prevention program every day of my life. So if you have it in your family, as soon as you know, you should be serious about preventing these 11 major risk factors. I wanna get into all those strategies, uh, but let's talk a little bit about what's driving this? What is causing this? I mean, I would imagine a portion of the spike that we're seeing, this increase in incidence, is related to the fact that people are living long and baby boomers are aging up. But also, I suspect that lifestyle habits are contributing to this as well with the increase in type 2 diabetes, obesity, hypertension, and the like. So what's causing cognitive decline? Are seriously unhealthy lifestyle and undisciplined minds. Did you know depression doubles the risk of Alzheimer's in women and quadruples it in men? What is the relationship between depression and dementia? So many people think if you're an older person and you get depressed, it's actually a precursor to dementia. They're both brain diseases or brain problems, if you will. And it's critical in the M in Bright Minds mental health stuff. So I was so excited about this mm. because what I came to realize, I started looking at the brain in 1991 and we've looked at over 250,000 scans. But early on, I came to realize you are not stuck with the brain you have. You can make it better and I can prove it. And so if I look at your brain and then you have a car accident, your brain's gonna be worse. If I look at your brain and then you go on a drug bender, your brain is gonna be worse. If I look at your brain and then you, all of a sudden you stop sleeping or you go through a divorce, odds are your brain's gonna change in a negative way. But I also did the big NFL study when the NFL was sort of lying, they had a problem with mm -hmm. traumatic brain injury in football. 80% of my players got better. So 45 years ago, I fell in love with psychiatry and I've loved it every day since. But I fell in love with the only medical specialty that never looks at the organ it treats. And I knew it was wrong and I knew it would change. I just had no idea it'd be part of it. 1991, I'm now a psychiatrist for about a decade. And I went to a lecture at my local hospital on brain spec imaging, single photon emission computed tomography. It's a nuclear medicine study that looks at blood flow and activity. It looks at how your brain works. And it basically shows us three things, healthy activity, too little activity, or too much. How is it doing that? What is the process by which that's revealing itself? So, Again, it's a nuclear medicine study. So what we do is we take a radio pharmaceutical. So you take a radioisotope. We take one we use is called technetium. And technetium has self-esteem problems. It doesn't like being who it is. And it changes shape. And when it changes shape, it produces a photon or a little packet of light that we can measure. So we combine technetium 
with HMPAO, a medicine that's easily taken up by cells in the brain, combine them, inject them into your arm, and it's called a first pass extraction. So 70% of it is taken up in your brain in that first pass, so within about two minutes. And then, so it's the hardest part of the procedure, a little tiny needle into a vein in your arm, inject the medicine, it lights up your brain, and then we can measure it, have you lay on a camera table. So this was sort of an inciting incident that allowed you to see the benefits of using this as a diagnostic tool, this imaging technology. Yes. Yeah. I like it when my patients get better. So I went into psychiatry and it was totally personal for me. And I loved it, but I was already getting criticism. From it. It's like, oh, we don't do this. It's not standard. It's not what we do. But 1992, all day seminar at the American Psychiatric Association, Brain Spect Imaging and Child Psychiatry, because I'm also a child psychiatrist. And I'm so excited because I'm meeting colleagues who do it. And in 1993, I teach with that group. So I'm like all in on the technology. But it was 1993, lots of pushback from the American Psychiatric Association because it doesn't fit the current diagnostic paradigm. Mm -hmm. It's like, stop giving people the diagnosis of depression. Depression's a symptom cluster. It shouldn't be a diagnosis. It's sort of like... Chest pain is a symptom. So if you think about it, he's Columbine or Sandy Hook or Parkland, Florida waiting to happen. And I'm like, I want to see him tomorrow. And they lived eight hours from me. So they brought him to me. I'm like, buddy, what's going on? And he's like, Uncle Danny, I'm just mad all the time. I'm like, is anybody hurting you? No. Is anybody teasing you? No. Is anybody touching you in places that shouldn't be touching you? No. And... 999 child psychiatrists out of a thousand would put them on medicine and therapy. And because of my experience, I already scanned a thousand people at that point. I'm like, he's got a left temporal lobe problem. And so I'm like, I held his hand while he held his teddy bear and got scanned. And he was missing the function of his left temporal lobe. I'd never seen it. I've seen it a hundred times since then. Turned out he had a cyst the size of a golf ball occupied in the space of his left temporal lobe. And I told his pediatrician, I said, you find somebody to take it out because he wasn't in my neighborhood. And he talked to three neurologists. All of them said they wouldn't touch the cyst until he had real symptoms. At which point I lost my mind mm. and I start screaming at the pediatrician of a homicidal, suicidal child who attacks people for no reason. What do you mean real symptoms? And he got anxious and he said, I think they mean like seizures or he loses consciousness. I'm like, serious? And in my head, I'm like, neurologists, neurologists, neurosurgeons, neurosurgeons will do stuff. So I called UCLA, talked to the head of the pediatric neurosurgery department, Jorge Lazaro, and he said, Dr. Amen, when these cysts are symptomatic, we drain them. He's obviously symptomatic. And after the surgery, I got two calls. One from my sister-in-law who said the surgery went really well, and when Andrew woke up, he smiled at her. She said, Danny, he's not smiled for a year. And then I got a call from Dr. Lazarev who said, oh my God, Dr. Amen, that cyst was so aggressive that put so much pressure on Andrew's brain that thinned the bone over his left temporal lobe. So his skull had been thinned. He said if he would have been hit in the head with the basketball, it would have killed him instantly. Either way, he would have been dead in six months. That's an amazing story. What's so interesting is the idea that our personalities are not static, that something amiss with the brain could completely change a person's outlook on life, how they show up in the world, the thoughts that they're entertaining. And with, in the case of that example, like a simple procedure, not a simple procedure, but a, a procedure could completely change that. Good or bad, yeah. right? It can go, could go either the other way. way. But after Andrew, and you know, it's now 30 years later, 29 years later, Andrew's married, has two children, has his own business. I mean, he's normal. And it was that moment I lost my anxiety and my need for you to like me. Mm. That's when the war began mm -hmm. to try to change 
psychiatry to become, let's like, come on, we need to get into the 21st century. And 1979, when I told my dad I wanted to be a psychiatrist, he asked me why I didn't want to be a real doctor. Yeah, he wasn't happy about it. Why I wanted to be a nut doctor and hang out with nuts all day long. But that, he just was just reflecting what society believes, that you're weak if you have a mental health problem, you're bad if you have a behavioral problem. And th- the images clearly taught me free will is not zero or 100, mm-hmm. that free will is gray. And I ended up testifying in some death penalty cases. And- or one of my favorite stories is Adriana, who I just dearly love, normal 16-year-old, beautiful, goes to Yosemite. They think it's a magic moment when they're surrounded by six deer. Ten days later, she becomes aggressive. She starts to hallucinate. She's paranoid. She's hospitalized, given a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And after three hospitalizations, multiple medications, the family spent $100,000. Adriana's a shell. She comes to our clinic, sees one of our doctors, her brain's on fire. Why is her brain on fire? Uh, You know, we see inflammation. Turned out she had Lyme disease. On an antibiotic, within a year, she's normal. She graduated from Pepperdine. She's got a master's degree from the University of London. She's normal. I think infectious disease, and we'll talk about COVID because it's part of it, is a major cause of psychiatric problems. And nobody knows about it mm. because people aren't looking at the brain. And so you ask me, you know, what are sort of the big lessons I've learned? Mild traumatic brain injury is a major cause of psychiatric illness. And nobody knows it because they don't look. 